So welcome back, everybody. If you could take your seats, uh, we'll now restart the session. So, um, you know, this is whatever it is, end of 2013. So um, there's a Twitter sphere going on at the same time as we are um, all here in person. Uh, the hashtag is TCACONF. So true cost accounting, TCACONF is the hashtag um, for this session. Apparently, there's quite a lot up there. Um, you can also see on the Sustainable Food Trust website, you can see the um, videos now. Um, I'm not suggesting you watch them now, but you can see the videos now for the various in-depth workshops that we've done over the last uh, couple of days on different dimensions of this. Um, if I could have the speakers sitting at the front uh, as well, this would, you know, create the vague impression that we are going to begin. Um, in addition to our virtual, you know, social media space, we have appearing on this amazing piece of paper here to our left, the work of uh, Margaret Dreschler, who is a graphic artist who is capturing not only the content, but much of the spirit of what's happening here. So um, again, not at this moment, but when you can, do come and have a look at uh, how she is bringing this all to life. And um, it's quite extraordinary uh, how uh, good she is at this. So this is probably when you should start stopping talking to each other. Oh, I actually think I've broken something. If someone can ping. So if the last sessions did nothing, they will have certainly convinced you of the uh, need for action, which was their intention. It sounded from the questions that most of you already had a feeling that there was a need for action and have indeed been trying to get action for many decades. Hence the questions about, well, how do we close this gap between knowledge and action? This um, next session is going to talk about true cost accounting in practice. So we very much will be on the, uh, the application of this tool to the you know, long-standing struggles and challenges that we have. We're going to start um, with um, uh, Pete Myers, Dr. Pete Myers, um, who is the founder, CEO, and chief scientist of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a not-for-profit not uh, founded in 2002 to increase public understanding of the links, scientific links between environmental factors and human health. So this, I think, will get to a number of the questions we didn't have, have a chance to fully explore a moment ago. Um, it's not just the nutritional content of what we're eating, but the, um, the presence of a wide variety of other chemicals in that food which are having these um, health consequences. So let's start then from, with hearing from, uh, from Pete Myers. Great. If you could be quiet, it'd be great. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. And I'm pleased to see that uh, most of the people have made it back from the coffee, as tempting as that was. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? So, um, so we're here to talk about internalizing externalized costs. And, and you know, that's such an abstract concept, isn't it? Particularly with respect to public health. So I thought I'd begin by making it much more personal. I want to ask you a series of questions. And I want you to put your hands up if the answer to those questions is yes. OK? I want you to think about your family. I want you to think about your kids, that circle of close friends, your parents. And I want you to put your hand up if the answer is yes to the following series of questions. How many within that close circle have experienced breast cancer? Put your, put your hands up. What about infertility? What about diabetes? 
or obesity. What about autoimmune diseases? Okay, I could go on in this list. Let me ask one last question. All of you who put your hand up at least once, put it up again and hold it up as you look around and you see what proportion of all of us have been affected by diseases, some proportion of which are being caused by exposure to chemicals. We don't know exactly what proportion, but the science that's emerged over the last 20 years says it is significant. And the good part of that is, actually, the interventions are quite simple. We reduce exposures, and that's really good news. So when we look at the externalized costs of environmental chemicals used in, in agrochemistry, we know that those costs are real. We heard earlier how difficult it is to estimate them. If you want to think about being looking at, at, at a landscape in a fog, and you can just see the barest outlines of a, of a mountain range in the background, this, how big those costs are right now, we don't know if, if they're the Blue Ridge of Eastern North America, we don't know if they're the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, but we know that they're substantial, they're big, and they're preventable. So we know, what we actually know right now, the hard numbers in the US, for example, a study came out uh, several years ago that said about $1.2 billion a year is caused in, in health costs is caused in the US by exposure to agricultural chemicals. What we know right now is that the current estimates we have vastly underestimate the true costs. Whoops. Only the tiniest fraction of agricultural chemicals have been studied for health effects by independent scientists. Independent, and that's a key thing. There's a marvelous paper written by a London resident, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Antonio, who looked at what happens if you use industry data to estimate the health effects of glyphosate, which is a key player in GMO agriculture? What happens if you look at those data and you restrict your analyses to those data versus what happens if you use the full array of scientific evidence that's available, especially from independent scientists? And the difference is vast. <laughs> Only a small fraction of the plausible health endpoints have been carefully studied from this perspective. Another reason why the, that mountain range is likely to be much bigger than we currently can prove. And finally, only a handful of studies have tried very hard to assess how one can connect the health effects from this science to the economic cost. I'm happy to say that Dr. Leo Trasand here is one of the pioneers in looking at chemical exposures and how you can convert those to economic costs. But there is an even larger elephant uh, in this room because almost all of the estimates to date are based on science that's a couple decades old. Over the last two decades, there's been a revolution in the environmental health sciences indicating that the proportion of diseases attributable to chemical exposures is far bigger and more common than what traditional estimates yield. And what this revolution in science is based upon is a field called epigenetics and its doppelganger endocrine disruption. Epigenetics are, are the things that control gene expression. Our genes aren't passive little BBs that live in us for the rest of our lives. They're being turned on trillions of times a second from conception all the way to death. And the timing of expression of genes is absolutely vital, especially, especially in fetal development. And when something, when a gene is turned on at the wrong time or it fails to turn on at the right time, that can lead to a lifetime of adverse consequences. And endocrine disruption is the is an effect mediated by chemicals that interfere with how hormones work. And hormones 
are the key signaling agents responsible for making sure that genes turn on and off at the right time. The United Nations is serious about this. They published a report in February of 2013 saying that endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. Now, any of you who know the, the WHO, which is where this report came from, that's a conservative agency, and yet they felt the evidence was strong enough to say endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. And I don't have time to review the tens of thousands of scientific papers that have been published on this, in this field over the last 20 years, but I'm going to extract from you very quickly some of the key points that are relevant to external costs of exposure. And one is that low doses, whoops, low doses matter a lot. The doses at which some of these chemicals are active is in the parts per, low parts per billion level. I'll say a little bit more about that. A second key thing is that events in the womb, exposures in the womb, play out over a lifetime of the individual who's exposed. Some of the, some of the diseases caused by fetal exposure do not manifest until middle or old age. And third, the tools we have used to try and tell us what's safe and what's not, they are deeply flawed. They don't reflect the last 20 years of modern molecular genetics and epigenetics. They're based upon tests that were developed in the 1950s. I'm not exaggerating. They don't reflect other things like the complexity of mixtures, cocktail effects, how it is that the hundreds of chemicals that are in us all the time interact. <laughs> because all tests for safety, virtually all tests, have been done one chemical at a time. And yet we know that there are interactions, there are additive effects, there sometimes are even larger than additive effects. So low doses matter a lot. These frogs were exposed to 2.5 parts per billion of atrazine from hatching to when they became adult frogs. 2.5 parts per billion is a low amount. When a farmer puts atrazine on the field to control weeds, they want to get a million parts per billion. You can measure atrazine in rainwater at around one part per billion. So these guys look normal. They're mating, except that the one on the bottom is a fully functional male despite being a genetic, excuse me, a fully functional female despite being a genetic male. The conversion was complete as a result of this exposure, from genetic male to fully functional female who can reproduce, can lay eggs, and those eggs grow up as fully functional adult frogs. 2.5 parts per billion. That's a big deal. We had a little discussion earlier about obesity. Here's an experiment published by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The mouse on your right is morbidly obese. The mouse on the left is a control animal. The animals ate the same amount of food. They exercised the same amount using scientific assessments of both those parameters. And yet, the mouse on the right is morbidly obese. It was exposed to one part per billion at birth of a chemical that's become known of a in a class of chemicals called obesogens. We know how they work, at least some of them. They work by converting, st by taking stem cells, sending the wrong signal to those stem cells, to the genes in the stem cells, and stem cells that would have become bone cells become fat cells. We know this process works in people, and I can go into that detail later. So the good news about this, and actually obesogens are, there are obesogens that are commonly used as fungicides in industrial agriculture. And the science, actually, with those fungicides is the best science on obesogens that exists. So low level matters. Low levels matter. And what that does is that takes this issue away from just the farm workers into our kitchens. The levels that we can observe in today's produce are in the same levels that we know can cause adverse effects in animals. So this is an issue about us and our families. These are big externalities. We're en route to getting better estimates as to what they are, and we hope to use them as this whole process moves forward to inform it in a way that engage the public because it's about 
our health. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you very much. I, I'd actually, I don't know whether to thank you or not, but <laughs> I acknowledge you very deeply, uh, <laughs> uh, Pete, for that. Um, so we're going to have a slight switch in order now, uh, just for the uh, direction of the presentation. So we're going to call Nadia back to talk about this pioneering work she's done on food waste. Somebody's going to put the presentation on? PowerPoint? Okay. So, now. so uh, we're asking for another okay. PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. so how do I change like this? Okay, fine. Oh, oops. Okay, this is a project that has started in the run up for Rio a few years ago we started to look at the impact of uh, food waste on um, the environment. The reason is that FAO has been working on uh, post-harvest losses for over 50 years with no results, really. We know everything about the techniques to avoid post-harvest losses, and we still have a very high level of losses, basically because it costs less to let things rot, perhaps, than invest in infrastructures and roads and so forth. And also at the producer level, especially at the retail level, you know, very often it's much more profitable sometimes to let food go to waste and, and have a new batch coming in. So uh, we thought in my program that uh, the economic cost of the food that is wasted maybe wasn't enough to take action, and we started evaluating the environmental cost of producing that food. So in 2011, the results of the total food uh, loss and waste in the world is 1.3 gigatons of food which is wasted. Translating this into natural resources impact, uh, this translates into 3.7 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year. So if waste were to be a country, it's like the third largest emitter in the world. It's huge. Um, the report quotes 3.3, actually that was published in September, now we rev revise it to 3.7. Um, I don't have the time to go into methodological issues, but um, this is the number. When you look at the water impact of uh, food waste, it's 250 uh, um, cubic kilometers per year of water which is, which is lost. That's enough water to meet the household needs in 2050 for the whole population of the Earth. It's a huge quantity also. In terms of land use, one third, 28% exactly actually, of the land which is used for producing food which never gets on the table gets lost. And this is 1.5 billion hectares. And the same for biodiversity. The biodiversity quantification was much more difficult because it's difficult to mix apples and oranges. So we looked at uh, red species lists, which are lost, and the trophic index for fisheries. Now, when we look at the economic cost of this food waste, loss and waste, I would say, it's 750 billion US dollar per year, which is lost. That's as much as the GDP of a country uh, like um, Saudi Arabia or even uh, Switzerland or Turkey, more or less. So it's a huge number. And when we published this in September, we were number one in the media in terms of coverage on how much money is lost on this. But it is nothing if we really put the factor in the environmental costs into that. Now, these are the producer costs, the 750 billion of 2009. Uh, that we used. If you look at the trade cost, the market cost of the same food, it goes up to 920 billion US per year, which goes through the bin. Um, well, it's, it's a bit difficult uh, valuation here on the trading because not all food is traded. So I would say it's somewhere between 750 and 920 billion US. And still, it's a big number economically. Now, when we try to put the environmental cost on them, and you're the first ones to see these results, which still are to be published. First of all, I have this a bit complex uh, framework, but uh, I'm not going to explain everything about it. We have to be aware that food is lost at all stages of the food supply chain. And one important category also is the food services, canteens, public canteens, and so forth, not only in the household level. So if we're losing food, it means that we have to do, produce more food, we're creating more pressure in terms of land use, 
And this has boundaries, uh, questions in terms of food availability for people in planetary boundaries, and also in terms of managing that waste. The landfill is a concern in many countries. The impact on the environment, of course, are on all the natural resources that we have on climate change, but there is one aspect which is very important, it's natural resources scarcity, uh, which is all the energy, and we, we have been talking in the past and still have to talk about peak oil also, because all the cheap food we have now is subsidized by fossil fuel. Uh, the energy cost, phosphorus, nitrogen, and water, these are all resources that are scarce and increasingly scarce, so the pricing on, on this has to be different. The socioeconomic costs vary from incentives and subsidies for mitigation and all the public uh, investment into mitigating that cost uh, to labor demand, food prices that go up, health issues, um, uh, displacement of people in case of um, climate change and other impacts. So we have tried to look at this framework in terms of the pillars of the sustainable livelihood approach. Uh, in terms of what is important for well-being, you know, in terms of income and food security and so forth. So this is the framework for the full cost accounting we have. We haven't done all of it, but uh, we have tried uh, evaluating the economic, uh, the economic valuation of natural resources. Now, I don't have the time to go into the methodological issues, so I will run through them very quickly. We have used the social cost of carbon for looking at the carbon accounting. Um, of course, you have different studies. There's the Stern report that you all know, but there is a more recent report also. And, and the level of uh, coverage is different. You have it in these two squares, the blue one and the green one on the screen. And of course, as you go toward more social costs, you know, you have more uncertainties in the valuation and also in terms of uh, uh, also the surprises that come with natural resources damage in the future. So there's a lot of uncertainties in those figures. Um, so this gives you an idea about the complexity of the elements to be accounted for. So if we take these two major studies of Waldorf and um, Stern, and we quantify the uh, natural resources cost in terms of climate change of the waste that we have, we are somewhere between 55 billion and 315 billion US dollar per year which is spent. Uh, we have a wi wide range as you see, but this is the closest we could get. For water, we take also, again, this uh, amount of 250 square, kilometer, uh, square meters of water which is wasted per year, and we look at the uh, consumption in irrigation uh, by plants. Uh, of course, we have different kind of uses of water. You have use value and non-use val <coughs> values. <coughs> non-use values are very difficult to evaluate. So the, the red is really where the study is trying to do now. <coughs> so you see that we are partly covering and the whole cost, not everything. So in terms of monetization of the water use, we are depending on the uh, benefit transfer uh, figure we are using <coughs> between 0 0.5 to 250 billion US dollars for the water valuation, which is also huge. A re realistic estimate of this wide range is around between than 50 billion for water. Of course, there are many open questions. I'm not going to go into the <coughs> methodological issues, but you know, what's the right price? How you, <coughs> I'm so sorry, <coughs> how you go about these valuations. Land use accounting is even more difficult. I mean, there are some methodologies, you know, that look at environmental services that the land is producing. We have done in our project, we have two indicators. One is land occupation and the other one is land degradation. And for us, the land degradation uh, aspect is very important because not uh, the status of the land that you have is going to you, give you different types of or levels of ecosystem services. And by the way, in ecosystem services, we have the regulating ecosystem services like uh, floods and water purification or whatever, but we also have provisioning. Provisioning is the capacity to produce food. Huh? It's also an ecosystem service since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So only by looking at land degradation, we have 10 to 130 billion US dollar in terms of land use. Uh, and again, for biodiversity, I see that Ken is up, so I have to go quickly. <laughs> 
Um, biodiversity, we have used the, the indicators of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, but most of them are subsumed under land or, or climate. In the case of invasive species, we don't have enough data sets to do any meaningful global evaluation, but we have done something on nitrogen nutrification and pollinators and so forth, so we have some cost here in terms of fishing um, uh, costs, which are lost, 50 billion, uh, nitrogen, uh, 20 and the loss of pollinator 2025. So as you can see, it's very, very partial in terms of biodiversity and by no means complete. So only those partial evaluations, if I took the lowest and the highest uh, estimate that you have just seen, you can see that this doubles the amount of money which is lost with, through, uh, with food waste every year. And this is huge. Now, if we put all the costs, it would go to three, four times as much. And we haven't dealt with the health issues yet, only indirectly under climate change. So we have different um, uh, work ahead of us that we are working on this, uh, in these few months to, to continue the, to, to refine and finish this, uh, this modeling and publish the results by March next year. Um, but in full cost accounting, we have different challenges. And this is where we need to collectively work together to improve those kind of costs for them to be credible. For example, double counting of impacts. You know, you look at health impact on climate change that we have in the normal valuation, but after, under other aspects, you know, you do have also uh, the same kind of impact. So how do you avoid double counting? The data availability is always a problem, of course, but how you do the benefit transfer also, there are different discount rates and so forth which are in discussion. Social cost we have talked about, but how you narrow these estimates you know, is also another uh, methodological issue that depends on the model you're using from mass flow that we have now into equilibrium model and maybe into fuzzy models in the future. So just to conclude, this is what I said before, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, it's a huge cost of the uh, uh, food, food wastage that we have to really put on the table. And to put it on the table is uh, not to put it really in the food prices, but to allow better decision making by uh, businesses because you're going to have a surprise event that are going to inflate the price uh, and, and also in terms of policy making. So under this website, you have the uh, entry for this food loss and waste project. And as we do progress and we have results, it's all published on it. And there is a small video of th three minutes that I would invite you to look at. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nadia, for really another absolutely fantastic um, presentation. Um, and I think particularly powerful is how you explain what you did measure, what you didn't measure. Um, and how it all adds up, and I, I, I commend you. I think that some of the things you said there will help all of us understand where we are in this process. So we switched the order because next we have Tristram Stewart, who is, of course, very well known for um, his work on, uh, well, what do we do about um, the extent of this waste? Um, his uh, 2009 celebrated book, Waste Uncovering the Global Food Scandal, has led him into feeding the 5,000 and other things that I think he will speak about. So thank you, Tristram. Uh, thanks very much. Um, when Nadia's office contacted me, uh, I don't know, a year, a year and a half ago, I thought, finally, I can, I can stop worrying about food waste. The FAO and other institutions have been looking at various different impacts and costs and opportunities, but the one really missing gap was uh, measuring the overall environmental impacts of food waste. And I'd done some, well, not quite back of the envelope, but not much more than that, calculations of the sort that Nadia has now uh, really fleshed out. Um, but there are a couple of things uh, I'm going to uh, um, move on to, and I'm actually going to skip over these first two slides, three slides, um, and uh, start with the question, what's the difference between $20 and $6,500? It might seem self-evident to you, but in true cost accounting, the difference is, as Nadia has just uh, pointed out, uh, the difference is how and whether you include the impacts of land use and land use change in your production of food. Um, now, Patrick has asked me to talk about food waste, and I, I am going to talk about food waste, but what I'm going to say applies uh, equally to many of the other things that we do. Look, think of a third of the world's food being wasted. That's a third of the cultivable land of the planet being cultivated for no good purpose. 
you could think about something similar in respect of you know a roughly a third of the arable land or a bit more than that being used to grow crops to feed livestock that were not really domesticated in the first place to use those crops so it, it extends outwards but coming back to food waste it is the archetypal externality that is by definition the externality it is the stuff that we emit from the system and there have been lots of efforts throughout the last uh, 100 years or so to try to internalize, internalize those, uh, those costs, if you like. You know, most obvious ones are taxing waste. Um, you know, I hope I'm not being parochial by thinking of the EU landfill directive, which was precisely about trying to internalize the cost of disposing of waste within the system. So you have to pay to send stuff to landfill. But the problem with these taxes, uh, and in particular the EU landfill tax, but it applies anywhere, is that it completely misses the point of the main impacts of wasting stuff like food. EU landfill tax and the, the policies that have been adopted by nation states to implement uh, their obligations under that tax have focused entirely on just lifting stuff out of landfill and sending it one step up the hierarchy to composting or anaerobic digestion. Of course, vastly more resource efficiency can be gained by not wasting that stuff in the first place. And that's where there's been a bit of a policy vacuum. And in particular, uh, it's, the, it's the impacts on land use and land use change that the reduction of food waste has the biggest benefits. And just to point in with some you know, really big figures at the difference uh, that we're talking about. Nadia has just pointed out that according to her calculations, between 55 and $315 billion is the value of um, the carbon uh, emissions resulting from the production and processing of wasted food. I want us to think about that third of the cultivable uh, land of the planet. Let's imagine we didn't grow food on it because we're wasting it anyway. So let's stop food waste and leave it for a moment. This is not a plan, but this is a hypothetical. This is to bring to our attention one of the things that I think we're missing out on when we talk about the impacts, and particularly in true cost accounting. Let's imagine we leave that land and trees start growing on it. We select which bits we're going to leave. If we did that, the quantity of carbon sequestered thereby would be 26 billion tonnes a year. That's a value of 2,000 $210 billion, according to uh, Stern's uh, valuation of carbon emissions, which is controversial, but this is just an indication. So 2,210, it increases the, if you include that opportunity cost of using land, it increases the impact of not wasting or not using land in the first place. I hope uh, I'm, I'm making myself clear. Um, and. I'm going to try and illustrate just what that means in terms of actual implementable policies. I'm very interested in what we do with food waste that isn't fit for human consumption, and I think the next best option, and in fact it's not very controversial to say it, is to feed it to pigs. Now, this chart shows you how the carbon emissions that can be saved if you feed a tonne of food waste, on the first hand to an anaerobic digester to produce methane, thereby displacing conventional energy production because you can burn the methane and produce renewable energy. So per tonne of food waste, you can see how much carbon we save per tonne of food waste by doing that. If you compare that to feeding the same tonne of food waste to pigs, you save roughly 60% more. Um, and by the way, I'm being quite generous to AD here because I'm including some use of waste hot water, which many AD plants don't do. So you can see already it's vastly better, or it's significantly better, you could say. But I have not included, as many life cycle analyses and some true cost accounting efforts uh, do not, I have not included in these figures the impacts of land use change. If you do include the impacts of land use change, it's a different picture. What this chart assumes is that to grow the pig feed that you feed your pigs, which you can displace by using food waste instead, you don't have to import 40 million tonnes of soy meal to, to Europe every year because you're using your food waste, which at the moment is an environmental liability and instead can be used as a resource. So you displace the use of and the need for soy meal and thereby you avoid the demand for soy meal, which is driving, as we all know, deforestation, the ploughing up of the Cerrado, soil erosion, and all of the other impacts associated 
with, uh, with soy production in South America. Now, according to these figures, what I've done is actually divide the impact of that by 20 according to past 2050 stipulations that I should allow for 20 years of soy cultivation on any individual piece of land. So, in fact, if you didn't do that, it would be 20 times bigger than that. And just to give you an idea of this in monetary terms, so AD saves you $12 of carbon emissions. Feeding it to pigs without including land saves you $20, the $20 I started with. Feeding it to pigs and including the impacts of land use change and dividing that by 20 saves you $328. But I would argue, although it's not necessary to, because you know, it's already very clear that you should be feeding it to pigs, um, not in an AD plant if you possibly can, that you shouldn't be dividing it by 20. And that, if you don't, uh, saves you $6,573 carbon emissions. Why do I think we should be thinking about deforestation? I, you know, we've had some excellent presentations in the last few days in the workshops about the difference, for example, Adrian has told us about the difference between uh, the uh, costs of conventional versus best practice coffee production. We know about best practice meat production and, uh, and worst practice meat production, and we can compare those two. But I think what we have to keep in mind is what is the difference between demanding this kilo of whether it's coffee or meat or soy meal and not demanding it at all? Because not demanding it at all is surely the biggest gain of all. And therefore, both, I think, from an individual perspective when we go and buy and think about the process of production, but more importantly, when we think about national and even more important international policies, for example, the EU ban on using food waste to feed pigs, you'll get where I'm, I'm driving at here, um, is what we have to bear in mind is any additional demand for food of any type, more or less, anywhere in the world requires a corollary expansion of the agricultural frontier, which is happening at the expense of forests and grasslands. And that is the single biggest impact that we are having on our planet right now. It's the single biggest impact we've had historically. And any measurement of the impact of food, food waste, and food demand should, I think, assume to some extent that we're increasing the demand for deforestation. I hope you'll allow me one more minute. We've had a little bit about what are the mechanisms available for actually making some of these true costs reflected in, uh, in what, what is actually paid for. I've talked about waste tax being an effort towards that. We've had some other mechanisms. The British uh, uh, Parliament passed a law called the Groceries Code Adjudicator Bill, one of the primary objectives of which is to cause retailers to incur part of the cost of the waste that they cause their suppliers to produce. So they are obliged now to share the cost of waste they cause their supplies. They used to be able to offload it, and that was unfair. And the Competition Commission said that's unfair. And the code says, you're not allowed to do that. You've got to share it. So that's an attempt to internalize the cost into the business that is causing that waste. There are others, like tax rebates for food donated, which you see in France and America, thereby internalizing the social benefits of donating food rather than uh, destroying it. But the internalization process that my organization, Feeding the 5,000, focuses on is internalizing the cost of waste into the reputation of businesses, namely damaging the reputation, the brand image of a supermarket or a, another company that is particularly bad at food waste. And it is on brand image that these companies are currently competing. Damage their brand or enhance their brand through exposure of malpractice that is the way we have available to us right now to internalize the costs of waste and the costs of environmental damage. And not just to businesses, but to society as a whole. To internalize the impacts in our consciences by connecting us with the impacts of our food choices. That, I believe, is the immediate opportunity for true cost accounting. And indeed allows us not just to put a numerical value, but to value things that are in fact invaluable forests, species, planets. Brilliant. That was really fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, once again, you're seeing how 
this tool that may appear to be very econometric can be connected to a wide range of strategies and ways of mobilizing understanding and change. So thank you so much, uh, Tristram. So now we're going to hear from um, Adrian de Hout, uh, Ruiz, who is um, the executive director of True Price. Um, from in the Netherlands. Um, he also has an academic background. He's very involved in the Netherlands, generally in the sustainability movement. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be here, and I will do two things. First, I will introduce true pricing, and second, I will present a case we did on coffee from Brazil for the Sustainable Food Trust. So we see a global momentum for true cost accounting across the globe. And here's a non-exhaustive list of organizations working in this space. And I think true price can contribute to two questions you may have. One is how can we cut through the complexity and come to a method that can actually be applied on a large scale? And second, what can we actually do with it? So true price has together with partners from civil society, government and business developed a method to monetize environmental and social impacts, and it will make that open source. So next year we will publish guidelines on that. And it can be applied on several levels. First on the product level, if you have a product that costs 20 euros in the store, and you have five euro, uh, dollars of environmental costs, five dollars of social costs, then the true price is 30 dollars. Similarly, if you have a company with reported profits of 200 million, an environmental P&L profit and loss of minus 50 million, a social P&L of minus 20 million, then the true P&L is 120 million. And you can do the same thing for investments. So the method is only the starting point because the big question is what are you going to do with that? And we do three things. First, public information. So we make the method um, publicly available and we create awareness among individuals, consumers, and there is a huge appetite among the public for transparency. But we also raise awareness about, amongst organizations. We're working with Deloitte, Ernst & Young, and PwC for a um, report on the business case for true pricing for businesses. Second, we work on improvement programs, so setting up programs to improve the impacts at the start of the supply chain, because there typically the largest impacts are. And third, um, we help organizations calculate and improve their true prices, true profits, and true returns. So why do we do this? And I think this is very important. Um, so we define the true price as the retail price plus the gap, the social and environmental costs, which we need to close. And then, of course, nobody wants higher prices. The point is not to increase current prices by letting people pay for it. The point is providing people with the information with which we can improve and drive down the true prices by making products in a better way. And here there is an opportunity um, for several um, stakeholders. So on the screen you see in blue the margins for a product and product, gray the costs and orange the external costs. So if you're a business and you don't manage your impacts, then two things will happen. Your external costs will go up and your margin will go down by 2020. Think about it. Corporate investments in water are slated to go up by 60% in the coming five years, and commodity prices have doubled in the past decade. So we have a business problem, low margins, and a societal problem, higher external costs. So we, a way to address both of these issues is by measuring and then managing these impacts. Risk management, so prevent a BP oil spill, prevent a Rana Plaza accident. Performance management, branding, to provide income to invest in sustainable innovation. Supply chain innovation and product innovation. So, now we come to uh, a case we did or we are doing with the Sustainable Food Trust is for uh, coffee in Brazil based on publicly available data and we will make um, the results public in the start of the next year and these are preliminary results we can share with you. So it's a conventional pack of coffee of 250 grams um, and we know the retail price is around two dollars and the question is what is the true price? So the local context is very important. Also to ground this is very important to be uh, very specific. 
So we look at the Zona da Mata in Brazil, which is a major coffee producing region, 30 million kilograms of coffee per year, and 90% of the farmers there are smallholders. And they have farms of around 7 to 11 hectares, and they work with family and hard labor. And they have a hard time, especially if coffee prices are low. So now the first question to start with, what is the true price of a kilogram of conventional, non-certified, sun-dried coffee from this region? So the result we come up with is $5.17. $2 of the retail price and $3 of external costs. So now the second question we have to ask ourselves, um, and now we can ask, where does it come from? And which impacts did we consider? And we look at four big categories, resource use, pollution, workers, and impacts on consumers and local communities. And then the next question is, where are the largest impacts? Because, and this is very important uh, to, to us, is why do we do this? It is to create a sustainable economy where people now can have a decent life and also future generations can have a decent life. And that really focuses the core of the debate because we can disagree about many things, but actually we base our uh, met method on things there's global consensus on. For instance, the ILO has clear definitions of what is forced labor, what is child labor. The RUGI framework has consensus, created consensus among business and uh, civil society on what should be the response to human rights issues. And that is what we take as, as a point of departure. And then if we go back to coffee, where are the largest impacts? So the key impacts are on the social side, underpayment for farmers and hard labor, income discrimination, and on the environmental side, it is energy, water use, air pollution, and land use. So now, if we look at where the largest impacts are, it is clearly at the start of the supply chain. So there our focus, our energy should be at. And then the question becomes, if we now look at be best practice coffee that is actually being produced, how does it address these issues? And then you see several things. And we look at fair trade, organic coffee from agri-forestry farms. You see that the fair trade premium helps the income of the farmers because they receive part of the premium. Organic farming reduces the materials and energy footprint and soil pollution. And agroforestry farming improves the land use and the water use quite a lot. So, and to be honest, this best practice coffee is now a bit more expensive, $2.78. But it has a lower true price of $4.58. And then we have Two issues. So action to consumers, buy this uh, pack of coffee. It's better. Action to producers, how can we close the gap in the coming five years in a way that doesn't increase the retail price? So we have now identified, and it's uh, early work, four possible interventions. First is an equal pay program to address the income discrimination between men and women and uh, people with a colored and less colored skin, which is an issue in Brazil. Second, um, divert a bit of the premium that now goes to community programs of fair trade to directly to the wages of hard labor, because then you can tackle that issue. Third, increase the yield uh, potential, and that is really possible because uh, uh, you can increase them with 35 to 50%. And then also, uh, and that is the most tricky one, have sustainable energy programs on the farms. And then, uh, almost, almost ready, a very important metric of sustainability is what are the true profits of these farmers uh, if you include these external costs. And we see, and we take at the normal PL, at the environmental PL, the social PL, and then integrate that into the true PL. And we see that conventional farmers make very large true losses. Best practice farmers now are doing quite a lot better, but still negative. And with the measures we have identified, we potentially can make these farmers help them be truly profitable and ready for the next um, uh, 50 years to come. So what have we seen? The true price of conventional coffee from Zona de Mata is $5.17, of best practice current coffee, $4.58, and in five years we can come to um, a true price of $3.79. So I hope this has illustrated that 
Of course, we are not there yet into perfection, but this is actually true pricing, true cost accounting provides a tangible program for change with which we can start today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was another really, really interesting example of how we can use these techniques not just to name and shame, so to speak, but to convert into targeted programs to try to transform uh, the results on the ground as well as the experience of, the, of these farmers. Uh, certainly some of the data is pretty shocking, though, um, uh, and thank you very much for that. So continuing in this in, you know, fabulous international uh, spirit and theme, I now invite our last speaker, Hel Helmi Aboulaish from Egypt, uh, who uh, has also, like our other speakers, played a long-term role in, uh, in the sustainable agriculture movement um, in his country, mixing it with a social entrepreneurship angle, and in particular in his work that he's going to talk about now um, uh, in the desert. So. happy to share some of my experience from Egypt in farming the desert. Um, and I want to clarify that I'm only a simple farmer from, from a developing country. I'm not a scientist. And I'm totally in love with uh, compost, so this maybe is a problem. But anyhow, I will try to explain what we are doing in our, in our, uh, in our project. And how did it start? It started in 1975 when my father took us uh, and he's a born Egyptian from Austria to Egypt to show us the country. And he got very worried about what he saw in Egypt and he thought this unbelievable population growth, 20 million when he left in the 50s, Egypt, were 55 million in the 70s, today we are 84 million. I don't know whether you can imagine what this puts as a pressure on this very narrow green uh, uh, spot around the Nile, but it means that Egypt is uh, is in trouble ecologically, socially, culturally, economically, on all levels. Now, his idea was to reclaim desert soil through sustainable farming and on this sustainable farm to create a learning, living community tackling the social, cultural, ecological, and economic issues of Egypt, being an example for what is possible to be done for the future. Now, you know the story, scientists from Austria, from Egypt, from everywhere in the world whom he consulted, told him, forget about, this is impossible, it will never happen, it cannot happen, it's, it's simply not uh, viable. Now he, as a crazy Egyptian visionary, went for a mission impossible. And against all odds, transforming the desert worked. A miracle happened. And out of sand and stones in the eastern desert of, of Egypt, a community evolved, an oasis where people, animals, plants live and work together, thousands of people, kids, where, where, where only was sand and stone at the beginning through compost, living soils evolved, where we have all kinds of crops uh, available in Egypt. So people always ask us, of course, how is it possible? How did this miracle work? And I will try to touch on some of the factors, not all of them, of course. One, the most important, as I already mentioned, a miracle by itself, compost. We heard about it today. I can only reassure you that recycling plant and waste material into compost, into black gold for farmers, is a miracle by itself. It enabled us to create living soils, it enabled us to use 40% less water than our conventional neighbors. And for those who know something about Egypt, Egypt is importing 40% of its food today only because it's living below the poverty line of water. It's not an issue of land, it's an issue of we have no water. And by only going in sustainable farming, we would be able to get again to a self-sufficiency of 100%. It enabled us to sequester one ton of carbon per hectare every year for many, many years. And it enabled us to deal with the salt issue in the water, which is a major problem in conventional land reclamation. And 
it enabled us to aim for the impossible. If you see this, this is our last endeavor now in the Asian side of Egypt, on the Sinai, where we started in 2008 on this, in this particular region, which as you can see is really, I think, clearly an agricultural area. And uh, with, w within this sand dunes, when we started in 2008, we were all thinking, how long will it take us to make another second there? What would you think? How long would it take? It took us 30 years in Sekem. It took us 18 months on the Sinai. With only compost, we had our first crop of peanuts after 18 months. And I invite all of you to come and see and share. But the miracle is possible. Now, would this have been enough for the miracle of Sekem? No. I want to be very clear. I have to disappoint you. Without managing our value supply chain, without uh, closing the gap between farmers and end users, without having transparent pricing and fair trade pricing, without our partners in the value stream in Egypt and outside Egypt, some of them are here in the room, without some crazy ethical banks investing into this not viable business model. And I hope Peter recognizes that the only reason why he is invited is because he invested in Sekem. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it would not have been possible for us to create the biggest local organic market in any developing country outside Europe, US, and Japan. 75% of what we produce on 20,000 acres with 2,000 employees is sold in Egypt. And we are market leaders competing with the conventional multinationals in our market, producing 500 million tea bags of herbal tea every year for the local market. And again, would this have been enough? No. Without our investment into the community, in a learning, living community in the desert, investing into our people, without giving them equal opportunity, respect, hearing to them, without our network worldwide, friends everywhere in Europe and the whole, uh, in any country in the world, helping us, giving us donations, helping us with ideas, good thoughts, work, Sekem would not be there. And without some of us every day in the morning waking up and asking what are we going to do different. Changing every day is the only, the only way to go forward. The day when we will be happy and successful, you can forget about us. And I can tell you this is one of the biggest challenges, success. I have experienced this on myself, and I want to warn you, when you are getting very, very successful, take care, it's corrupting. <laughs> now, still this is not enough. Without investing into every single human being, on planet Earth, but for us in Sekem and any one of our people, our kids of the community, without trying to reconnect them to their real sources of inspiration, arts, religion, science, rebuilding the values, the enlightenment in Egypt, the enlightenment in the Islamic world will not happen. And this is what we are doing every day with hundreds of kids in our kindergartens and schools, with thousands of our people of the community in our medical center and adult education center, 400 students in our newly established Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development. Without all of this, it would have not worked. And it's complex. And if you search for a certain single indicator to measure and, and see what is, what is really going on, it's very difficult, it's very complex. And I think a reductionist point of view to it would never achieve what Sekem has achieved. Now, only in this holistic way, the miracle was possible. In 2007, we sat with our friends here from the Bilbao Desert Club. We established the Sustainable Development Flower, which is a set of indicators along all this uh, holistic sustainable development dimensions, ecological, cultural, social and economic, 120 indicators which we use and we 
publish our report as an annual report every year since 2007, so you are welcome to look on our website. A great management tool which helped us to get better and more competitive. And still, we had a problem. We were starting out as a model for Egypt, not only for a small community. And whenever we went out to promote these ideas, it got very clear that we have a single problem that we are still more expensive on the farm gate. And then we said we have to do a study and we have to see whether this is really true, having in mind all the distortions and subsidies in Egypt. And we set up a comparative study of the full cost of production between conventional agriculture and sustainable agriculture, seven most important food crops, covering 65% of the food of Egypt. And we did a calculation for 10 years, 2011, 2020, built on hard externalities only, so energy, fertilizer, water, carbon, no health impact, no environmental pollution, no social indicators. We took data from the Ministry of Agriculture, the FAO, and so on and so on. We had very conservative assumptions. And guess what? And I want to make sure that you can see and understand what is... <coughs> I did a mistake. Now, what I want to say is, basically, what this graph shows is that, for example, for potatoes, in 2012, we are already cheaper organically. For wheat, we will be cheaper in 2016. For cotton in 2018. For rice, 2018. Sugar beets today. Sugar cane, 2020. Basically, all of them within the next 10 years will, got, will get cheaper uh, only on these indicators. Now, if you imagine putting all, all the other indicators in, how much faster would we come to the break even? So, to conclude, I want to thank you very much. I, I hope we are going on with this work. I want to assure you that this will help us on our common strive for, for a better future. I want to assure you that me as a farmer and as a social entrepreneur, I will work on the inspirations I got over the last two days and make my indicators better. But I want to also tell you that I believe 100% that within the next 20, 30 years, we will be the mainstream. You may think I'm a dreamer, uh, these crazy people from Egypt, but I have, and we had in Africa, and the whole world, an inspiration, the late uh, Nelson Mativa Mandela, uh, who passed away yesterday and who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, it's been a pretty good morning, hasn't it? So um, we have four minutes to the scheduled lunch time, but we're going to go at, uh, another 10 minutes. So let's have uh, a few uh, comments and questions for our absolutely fantastic uh, panel here. So who'd like to kick us off? Uh, Mike. Yes, yes, but I, I, yeah, I can't good. answer the question. Who can answer the question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> all, all of the um, films of the workshops from the last two days that you were not all here for and from today are all available on the Sustainable Food Trust website, as will everyone's presentations. So, we can share this amazing power. All right, let's have some questions. Let's take you, yes. Um, I just have an observation more than a question, having listened to quite a number of speakers. And uh, what, I, what seems to occur to me is that when we talk about food, we don't talk about the nutritional aspect of food. We talk about food to fill ourselves. And I don't know how we can get this message across that food is both our energy, our medicine. I grew up in Nigeria as a child. And for me, food was such a variety of things. Yeah. 
things that I forage for, things that I ate seasonally, things that I ate for a particular reason because there was a particular need that I had. And I think there needs to be edible education. Uh, we need to talk about food in a different way. People need to know what they're eating, what they're eating it for. And I don't know how we could put that message across. So, let's take this question here. Hi, my name is Christina and I'm a student at City University. And my question is for Nadia. Um, it's about the data behind the estimates you showed and how reliable it is. Um, so I was just, I'm particularly interested in post-harvest losses in developing countries. And to me, the data in the 2011 report particularly for developing countries, isn't that reliable because, for example, for Southeast Asia, 70% of the estimates are either based on FAO assumptions or generic data or extrapolated from data from other regions. Um, so I know the FAO is doing the best it can do with like, the data it has, but I'm just interested, particularly my main area is East Africa, and have you heard of like AFLIS, like the African Post-Harvest Loss Information System? And do you, what do you think of that system, or what do you think is the best thing we can do to get accurate data, particularly for developing countries? You, you should go to the field and measure it. Uh, let's um, let's take the question back here. Someone wants to bring here. me to Africa. I'll go. Let's <laughs> take that, a question back here, and then we'll come forward. My name is Hadi Wuppmann, German League for Nature and Environment at University of Kassel. Nadja and Tristram, you made a very strong case against food waste. To make your case even stronger, why would you not include the avoided environmental effect if you do biogas first, compost later, and you don't have to buy the fertilizer? I think you should include it. It will not weaken your case, but it will make it much more stronger. And we have a lot of data available on this over the years. Super. Let's take another question at the back up here, and then we'll come to this side of the room. Oh, and Guillermo. Um, Nick Lamkin from the Organic Research Centre in the UK. Um, I'm an agricultural economist and I've been working on sort of the economics of food production systems for many decades now. And the whole issue of externalities and public goods delivered by agriculture and so on is, is a critical issue. But how we can translate that into a true cost type approach is still for me a real challenge. I'm not convinced yet by some of the examples that we've been hearing. I have two, two basic problems. One is that the price in the market is not necessarily a reflection of any costs. It's a reflection partly of consumer demand and partly of retailing strategies. Um, and the second thing is, which model of production do we take as our baseline in order to evaluate what the basic standard cost should be that we're building on? Um, I certainly uh, would have serious concerns about the real price approach um, that was described, because it's taking retail prices somehow uh, a, a baseline on which to add other costs. I think that, that yeah. uh, so I'd like to ask how these challenges are really dealt with. Yeah, I'm not sure we'll be able to deal with them now, but it's really important that we constantly remind ourselves of these challenges. So let's have a Guillermo here at the front, um, and then I think I will, we have to go this side of the room. It's a question for Pete. Uh, what, I'm, I'm just curious to know why there are some chemicals that have been more easily banned than others. Is there something intrinsic about those that have not been banned as easily that uh, we should be thinking differently about? Very, very interesting question. Let's go to this side of the room then. It's, if I could see how many people we have, it'll help. You want to start with? If we, Wait, so, hold on, can you take the microphone to the, yeah. <laughs> David G, European Environment Agency, just retired. For Nadia and uh, Tristam, a couple of elements missing here. When you put taxes on externalities, in general you use the revenues to reduce uh, other taxes so that people have got more money to buy the more expensive consumer goods. That's a key issue, really. The second is, in agriculture, you're blessed unlike energy, because you've got such strong positive externalities, which should, of course, be paid for. 
as, uh, you know, the, it's the opposite of tax on negative. You pay for positive externalities in agriculture. And you've got huge carbon and other positive externalities. Uh, and the third point I've forgotten, but that will do. <laughs> I sent a, a, a message to your brain. Just a, and then behind you, I think it's Anne. Anne Thrupp from the Berkeley Food Institute. Um, I wanted to ask Helmi if uh, you could comment or respond to a question about um, why more, uh, more food companies and food um, or producers, farmers, are not pursuing the incredible approach that you are using. Um, and related to that, are there, is there interest on the part of government agencies, um, <coughs> entities uh, that are supporting your effort to help, help to replicate or you know, take those, the lessons learned from your experience and help to support other farmers to pursue your approach? Other than your great leadership in talking about it, I'm just wondering if there's institutional or policy support that can, can really help spread what you're doing. Thank you. And then over here. Um, I'm Erasmus, a, a conservation PhD student in Cambridge. Just a question about SECEM. Um, so to what degree are you just taking nutrients in the form of compost from a fertile area to an infertile area and then just farming there? Is there not sort of like a subtraction that is uh, occurring to a certain degree? Good question. And then over here at the back here. Hi, Tracy was to the pig ask. I just wanted to know, you had the Gates Foundation over your couple of days. What do they think about SECEM? So instead of having GM crops to grow things on desert areas, what do they think about what you're doing? I'm looking to see if we have someone from Gates who would like to respond to that. I don't... And I think Roy is... Are you, are you here, Roy? Do you want to respond? No. Um, okay, fantastic questions. Uh, we, we have, I think, well, we'll maybe allow this other question that's sneaking in here with lots of lobbying. These are really, really great stuff that's coming out. I, I wish we had days and days. Uh, hi, I'm um, an engineer. Uh, keep talking on it, they'll turn it on now. Um, yeah. Oh, keep, keep speaking uh, of that. At uh, Surrey University, I'm actually doing a doctorate degree on accounting for social and environmental impacts. Um, we have a big challenge with uh, social impacts, and that comes from uh, child labor. And uh, in the coffee uh, case study, you put the number on the child labor, which we really find very difficult to put a price on that, because the need of future generations, of course, you have to take into account that child that is not being educated and it's in the field. So I would like to know, um, how did you come up with that price? Because then it yeah. will help me in my research as well. Thank you. Thank you. Another, you know, another impossible question. Fantastic to have students here. You will have to answer these questions yourselves. Uh, uh, it's really great that you're here. So let's give our speaker the chance to, uh, to, uh, to bounce back some of these questions um, in any particular order. Well, I, I can respond uh, quickly, I think, to Guillermo's question. And it's really, there's several factors that influence the, the chances of banning a particular chemical. One is the strength of the data. Uh, a second is the strength of the opposition, because there are big vested interests often, behind, always, behind these. But the third is unpredictable. It's the political moment. Um, and you need to have the first two in hand when the political moment arrives. And that's what leads to bans. And the longer a, a chemical has been out there, the, ho the bigger the vested interest, yeah. the more difficult it is for science to win yeah. the argument. Although the data accumulate as well. Yeah. Come. Ag chemicals, glyphosate, atrazine, and uh, probably, um, well, there, there are many in the lower tier. But the re interesting thing about glyphosate is you take glyphosate out and you eliminate most of GMO agriculture. Yeah. And the strength of the data emerging on glyphosate is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was advertised as safe because the, it's, the way it hurts weeds is it uh, interferes with a specific enzyme in plants. It's not in us, it's not a problem, right? Well, unfortunately, there's a large body of literature that's emerged that says that 
uh, glyphosate is also a retinoid uh, signal disruptor. And when that happens in vertebrates, you get birth defects, and you get a lot of other things. And the data that are coming out on the levels of exposure required of glyphosate to produce these things in vertebrates is that it's well within the range of exposure to farm workers, and it's within the range of what's in food in soy and corn on the market today. What we have coming out of the science is, in a certain way, the incredible conservative innovation of life, that chemicals that, uh, that uh, genes and chemicals that we thought were specific to particular groups turn out to be reversions of genes and chemicals that were useful to other groups, even at other long back stages of evolution. So it's really unraveling the idea that we can target uh, uh, these chemicals. It's going to make, uh, it's going to change everything, that understanding, if it's allowed to come forward. Helmi, reactions? Yeah, <clears throat> first, uh, regarding the study, uh, we did this study, as, as you could see, in the year 2010, and it was meant to uh, cause a revolution in Egypt, which it did in January 2011. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, since then, we are very busy with the revolution and the after waves of the revolution, but Soon things will stabilize and we will go back with this study and make sure that we are on the right path for, for the new Egypt. Uh, on the other hand, uh, farmers, entrepreneurs are taking on the, the, these ideas. We have 60,000 acres today, which is 1% of our arable land uh, organic certified. Uh, the limiting factor here is capacity. So our universities, schools, many, many capacity building institutions for research and so on are needed. This is going to be our biggest challenge for the years to come, to build capacity for this transition. And regarding compost, I want to assure you, the compost is done out of recycling plant waste from, from the farms and out of animal waste. And yes, for the very first year, obviously we have to produce this compost on only one of our farms and transport the compost. But from the second year onwards, the compost is always produced on farm with the waste uh, available. So it is a sustainable system, and we don't move uh, earth or soil or anything like that. Thank you, Helmi. Tricia? Oh, have I got you, you, oh, I'm mic'd, aren't I? <laughs> um, so starting with Hata Rockman's uh, point about the additional uh, benefits in terms of uh, using compost and displacing the use of fertilizer, um, of course that's uh, massively significant. I don't ignore it in my book. Just to clarify, the reason why that isn't included on the pigs versus anaerobic digestion data is that I assume all things are equal. They both, both those treatments of food waste, avoid landfill. Both of them mean that the uh, organic material is available for fertilizer. If you use it as compost or anaerobic digestion digestate, they can go on the land. Pig poo is also an excellent fertilizer. Now, Professor Silver and I had a furious row yesterday about the, the, whether you should be feeding food waste to a composter or to an AD and the potential organic uh, uh, content in soil benefits of compost versus pigs. But the point that I'm really trying to make is that whilst I acknowledge that there are some arguments to say that you lose some organic uh, content by feeding it to a pig, the benefits by avoiding the demand for more food, namely pig feed, outweigh vastly uh, that marginal difference, and I'd be very interested to discuss that further, but um, yeah. just to say that is taken into account in other calculations, but isn't relevant to that one. On the issue uh, of... Very uh, quick. Ta Go for it, but be oh, quick. I don't sorry. need to answer it. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry uh, uh, to do this, but um, there were so many good questions, but I think we probably don't have time. So, Nadia, do you want to take, and then you can follow up one-on-one. -on -one. I can take quickly about five questions, I think, which were addressed to me. <laughs> Uh, the first one is about food having nutrition. Of course, I mean it's an important issue, and it hasn't been it hasn't been dealt with. The only country that has have been has had data sets on the nutrition quality of crops is USDA website actually since since the Second World War. And if you look at it, you will notice that most of the crops have lost about 30 percent of the nutrition. Yeah. So. That's right. The future will be really looking at nutrition index per hectare and not yield per hectare, but hasn't yeah. been done and we are far from there yet. Super. Um, anyway. Choose, choose, choose one other question to answer. 
in terms of the quality of the post-harvest classes in um, information we have in Faustat, the quality of the information is as good as the countries give it to us. And indeed, there are different challenges on the other or waste, you know, uh, reports that we have. Because, of course, this is a global study, so you have to have the same methodology and all countries included. We do have data issues and the global study is to just ring the bell on, on a problem that needs to be addressed. And then for any meaningful um, decision making and action, you really have to do the study at the local level with research. And this is what FAO now is being engaged in. Um, and studies like this can stimulate the right kinds of local studies yes. to be done. Yes, and then the other three That's questions quickly, were really quickly. on positive externalities, how you calculate for social costs and so forth. Uh, we have had a, an e-forum on full cost accounting in the past five weeks on food waste. About 300 people registered, but we had maybe, I didn't count, but less than 10 people who participated because we have had input papers with all the state of knowledge and it was difficult to really add to these things. So I would really invite you to look at the website and if you have anything, because we are really looking for cooperation to improve those kind of uh, calculation and how we're going to include avoided costs, positive externalities and so forth. So this is a conversation in progress and I really hope that after this meeting we'll be working more together. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian? Yeah, I'd like to respond to two questions. First, there was someone still unconvinced in the room. Uh, that has been noted. Um, <laughs> no, but, but, but I'm happy about that because I think one of the risks in this approach is that it, it is uh, complex at the backside, so that people jump into it too quickly. So it's good that people reflect on that. And in particular, there was a question about uh, the, um, uh, whether you should take market prices as given. In a way, we think there is no other way than to take market prices as a given. Uh, because there's one stream of many economists who have tried to come up with shadow prices uh, and come up with the perfect economy. So we think it's not possible to come up with perfect prices, but rather our approach is very pragmatic, is that we want to have a sustainable economy, so we want to drive down the gap, CO2 emissions, child labor, etc. So that is why we add it to the market price, so that we can focus on the issues that are important uh, and not coming up with a perfect world. And then there was another question. Um, um, very brief about a, a child uh, labor. So what we do there, and again, we don't try to put an intrinsic value on the things because we think that's not a way to go. It's impossible to put intrinsic values in monetary terms. But you can look in child labor at uh, very specific ILO conditions. And also, what do you need to do if there is a child that has been working? What are the steps you need to take to remedy that? Um, and that are things you, you, you can cost uh, quite effectively. Yeah. So. I think these two panels have both been utterly extraordinary. Uh, I think we'll all be thinking differently going forward. I think a big round of applause to them.